Hi. Uh, so I'm Mark Lawrence. I'm going to be the host for today. I will be interviewing Mr. Manso Howard from Ghana's Forestry Commission and also Tony, who actually runs the Mountain Paradise Lodge. And by the way, this lodge has an absolutely fantastic view of the Abatime Forest. We had lunch there a couple of weeks ago and um, pretty impressive. Um, and both Mr. Manso Howard and Tony are members of the Abatime community in Ghana. And we will be asking them some questions for about 30 minutes. And then we'll open the floor for about 10 minutes of questions. One point that I'd like to make though, is that neither of our guests today are actually part of the project team. And so they're basically independent voices from the community. Actually, I'm just reading the note that was just posted. And they and so Tony kind of represents the community, and Mr. Manso Howard actually represents the government, the, the Forestry Commission. But before we start, I just want again to thank the Bankless DAO and Bankless Africa, in, in particular Ernest, for helping um, to put together this forum um, so that we can discuss global warming and also digital carbon offsets. So as you all probably know, many scientists believe that global warming is caused by greenhouse gas emissions. And so as an incentive to reverse global warming, organizations that remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or even reduce greenhouse gas emissions can sell carbon offsets to other buyers. So this is a way to monetize conservation. And typically these buyers, they want to buy carbon offsets to offset their, their carbon footprint. However, traditional carbon offsets are designed to incentivize new carbon sequestration, you know, such as planting new trees. Yeah. Unfortunately, this means that existing mature forests, like the Abatime forest, that, uh, you know, many people believe are Earth's best carbon sink, are actually excluded from traditional carbon offset programs because their carbon sequestration is regarded as business as usual and not additional. So mature forests are just not welcome. Conversely, our goal is not to incentivize new carbon sequestration. Rather, our goal is to promote equity and inclusion in climate finance. In, and in pursuit of equity and inclusion, traditional carbon offsets are really the problem rather than the solution. And so we therefore plan to use NFTs to completely disrupt the traditional carbon offset industry and give mature forests like the Abatime forest a pathway to equity and inclusion in climate finance. And a percentage of the revenues from our NFT sale will actually go towards funding forest management activities and also a social innovation studio will help local entrepreneurs solve local problems. So we provide inclusion by using these NFTs to create a whole new class of digital carbon offsets that actually include mature forests. So they're included rather than excluded. We provide equity by eliminating the expensive certification intermediaries and this reduces the certification cost for our digital carbon offsets from hundreds of thousands of dollars to zero dollars. So this program is costing the Abatime forestry community zero dollars to participate. And that's making it equally access to any low income community that has a mature forest. And so, um, the way we achieve this zero cost certification is by using satellite technology, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and other innovations to estimate the carbon sequestration rates for the forest instead of using expensive manual international consultants. So we eliminate the intermediaries. And now satellite technology is not as accurate as manual measurements where you know, expensive consultants fly out from Norway and use tape measures to measure the size of trees. Um, but we believe that, or at least we would rather have less accuracy 
if we can drive down the certification cost of zero dollars. And the first beneficiary of our new digital carbon offset program is the Abitime forestry community in the Volta region of Ghana. So that's why we've invited our very, very special guest today to join us. And so Mr. Manso Howard is the regional manager for the Forestry Commission and Tony runs the Mountain Paradise Lodge in Abitime. So, um, Tony and Mr. Manso Howard, welcome, welcome to Bankless Africa. Thank you, Zab. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, so my first question is for Mr. Manso Howard. Can you, can you please introduce yourself? Good. My name, as you mentioned, okay. is um, Man Manso okay. Howard. Yeah, and I'm the regional manager for the Forestry Commission for the Water Region of Ghana. Okay. Currently, currently the Water Region Forestry Commission is divided into two districts. We have the Go districts and we have the Denu Sugakope districts. Avatime happens to be under Whole forest districts. So that's the first introduction of myself and my scope of work. Okay. Thank you. And Tony, can you introduce yourself? I am Tony Fiakbui, uh, a native of the Volta region and the proprietor of the Mountain Paradise Lodge, which I have been running from 2003 to date. Okay. And yeah. what I should mention again, we actually went to Ghana a couple of weeks ago. And when we were there, we actually met with Mr. Manso Howard and his team from the Forestry Commission. And we also visited Tony's Lodge and we had a fantastic lunch there with a, with a great view of the, of the forest. And so um, my next question um, is for Mr. Manso Howard. So what is the role of the Forestry Commission in Ghana? Thank you, sir. The role of the Forestry Commission in Ghana specifically is to ensure the day-to-day -day administration and the management of the forest estates in the Volta region. Apparently, Ghana's forest management is under the auspices of the Forestry Commission. And it cascades down to all the 16 regions we have in the country, of which the Volta region is one. Therefore, our mandate is for the management, the protection and development of Ghana's forest estates. To which as the regional forestry manager for the region, for the water region, my mandate is to ensure the management, the protection and development of all forest resources in the water region, of which Abitimi is part. Okay, thank you. So, so is the Forestry Commission a, um, a branch of the government of Ghana? Definitely so. That's right. That is it. Okay, and can you can you explain your role within the Forestry Commission? My role as a regional manager is to ensure the adequate protection of the forest resources in the region. I am in charge of the day-to-day -day administration of the Regional Forestry Commission. My oversight responsibility is on the two forest districts, as I said earlier on, two, the two forest districts under the Volta region is the whole district and the Sugakope Denu districts. The Sugakope Denu district is the south, the southernmost part of the region. And the whole district forms the northern part of the region, which Abatimi falls under. So my role additionally is to oversee to the sound management of these two forest districts, which have two separate district managers manning these districts. 
So, okay, all right, thank you. Actually, yes. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to ask you know one more clarification because when you met, you explained there's a difference between the forestry areas that are owned by the government and the forestry areas that are owned by individuals and and local local people. So, can you just re-explain the difference between those different um, forestry areas? All right, the government of Ghana under our colonial masters gazetted some forest estates as reserved land solely for the protection of the forest in them. These are designated areas that we call forest reserves. And those are areas which fall under the direct management and supervision by the government. Those areas, we have decreased and laws governing them. In as much as we have oversight responsibility over the outside areas of these forest estates. In the outside forest areas, government do not have any serious protection rules. We only offer advisory rules. So with the forest reserves as gazetted by law, they are duly protected by guards, forest guards. The areas that are clearly delineated from the outside forest reserves, which we do not have mandates in their protection. We only manage the trees and the scattered forest in them but we do not do protection work there. Because those outside forest reserve lands are vested or are owned by families, individuals, and other um, prospective and other um, um, owners who, in a way, bought their land from maybe chiefs or, or other individuals. So when you look at uh, Volta region per se, we have nine forest reserves, nine forest estates, which are clearly delineated from other outside areas where people have their buildings, their farms, and their project activities. In this designated nine forest reserves, uh, human activities are not permitted there. Human activities like farming activities, development of um, um, other land uses, are not permitted there. So they are clearly distinct from the outside forest reserve. And our mandate is to secure them and protect them against any encroachment from any people, from any indigenous people, from any person coming from the outside forest reserve. So aside these forest reserves, all other, for other, all other forests are called outside forest reserves. So we have on forest reserves, these are the protected forest reserves, and then we have outside forest reserves. Thank you. Okay, and then just for the audience, I just wanna make it clear that when we met with Mr. Manso Howard, he made it clear to us that the um, forestry areas that are currently controlled by the government, the reserves that are owned or controlled by the government, cannot be part of this program, um, but the external or outside forestry areas that are owned by the clans and, and individual um, people can be part of the program. And just a reminder that the Paramount Chief of Abatime sent us a letter um, asking to be part of this program and also sent a letter to the regional head of the Forestry Commission um, asking for support to be part of this program. And um, Mr. Howard actually sent a letter back responding saying um, that um, the Forestry Commission will provide whatever support. They agree with what we're doing and will provide whatever support they can. So thank you so much for that. And so now I have a, a question for Tony. So Tony, um, tell us about the, the Mountain Paradise Lodge. Yeah, the, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the Mountain Paradise Lodge can be considered more of a, a project 
uh, than a business. Because in July of uh, 2001, uh, I visited Abatime with a friend of mine. And uh, looking at the pristine vegetation of the Abatime area, uh, I felt it was important to have some kind of intervention. And what I could figure out then was to use tourism as a tool for conservation. So our presence in Abatime is basically to help to restore the ecological integrity of the area. Uh, so the mountain paradise uh, is the commercial wing of our non-governmental organization that we call the Friends of Gemi. Friends of Gemi because Gemi one is the highest uh, point in the whole area. And so anybody who shares in the vision of ensuring that we uh, maintain the ecological integrity of the area is welcome on board. That is why we call it Friends of Gemi. So the mountain paradise is actually the commercial wing of Friends of Gemi because we don't have any external support. So we, there was a need for us to uh, find our own way of generating money to do this. So yes, it's not only a commercial entity, but it's also an intervention in the area. Uh, we have done a lot of uh, community uh, engagements in the past, and it is still going on. Uh, we have a good rapport with the whole, the entire Avatime community and the adjoining communities like Loba and Tafi areas. So basically that is uh, the mountain paradise. Okay, and I think you partially answered my next question, which was how did you end up actually running um, the lodge? And so yeah. was that because you were already in the NGO and you were looking to extend the reach of the NGO? The NGO came about as a result of uh, discovering the pristine forest of the Abatime Hills. Um, so there was a need for us having seen the area, but then uh, it should be noted that by then the road network was virtually non-existent. So the road we have now was not that way uh, 20 years ago. 20 years ago, for almost two weeks, there will be no, there will be no vehicles on that road. Uh, we had a very bad road, but under very beautiful forest cover. So yes, we said, ah, this is a, an opportunity to use tourism to create a spot for backpacker tourists to come uh, to enjoy nature in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, that is uh, how the mountain paradise uh, uh, came. Okay. And it seems to me that you're a conservationist. Where, where did this all come from? What is the genesis of that? <laughs> yeah, the genesis of my conservationists uh, comes from my mother's womb, <laughs> because I can say that I was born with it. As a little boy, I used to do a lot of uh, camping. Anywhere that we found a little shrub, I organized my friends, and then we camped there, especially on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, we also had a, a team to protect lizards because we had some friends who used to go around killing lizards because the story was that uh, 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 the lizard set God's house on fire. And so they tried to avenge uh, on behalf of God. So they would go around killing lizards and we would go around fighting them against the killing of the lizards. Uh, all these, I mean, just by instincts, we used to do. Uh, I have been a school teacher. And so when I became a teacher, I organized my kids for various wildlife activities. Uh, I have been a member of the Ghana Wildlife Society and I formed wildlife clubs in the about three different schools. Um, in the center of Accra, we have the conservation center at the Efua Sutherland Park. 
uh, we were the patrons actually who mobilized funds for the construction construction of that uh, facility. Uh, it's worthy of note. In 1991, I organized a trip to the Kakum National Park where we have the canopy walkway in Cape Coast. I remember vividly upon entering the forest, one little girl said, girl said ah, Achimota Forest is a grassland, you know? For the first time, she could actually appreciate uh, a forest. And of course, I don't remember who that kid was. I don't know what she's doing now, but I, I'm very, very certain that uh, that visit had made some impact on her. So yes, uh, anything nature and natural is very dear to my heart. That is the reason I fell in love with the pristine of Atime Hills. Thank you so much for that, that story. Very touching. And, and so my next question, Mr. Um, Manso Howard, um, obviously you must be a conservationist being in the job that, that you're in, otherwise you wouldn't be in that job. Um, what, is, what is the genesis of, of you, you know, your belief or your commitment to conservation and conservationism? Well, um, my, my upbringing, you know, in Ghana, we say that almost everybody comes from a village. And I remember in my schooling, um, youthful age, every vacation, our mother will send us to our grandmothers in our villages. And we used to go to farm to help her on their farm. And on the way to the farm and on the farm itself, you see beautiful forest um, trees and bushes. And so I enjoy the microclimate in the farms, on the way to the farms. And I always um, love to be around trees. So I had grown with this and, and as I entered the university, I, 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 chose a I chose a course that really helped me to enjoy this kind of uh, 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 venture as, as, as life goes on. So I really loved agriculture and, and I mastered and or I specialized in forestry to uh, um, have this kind of forest uh, environment around me throughout my life. And after school, I can, I must say that I've enjoyed working anywhere where there are forests and where we have forest um, officers and, and forest um, estates to work in. So I can say that my love for forestry work spans from my youthful age when I used to go to village every vacation, every vacation, my mother would gather all the children and go to our uh, grandmothers and then help them on their farm. So that is the, 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 the way I, my, my, my love for forest was, was <laughs> nurtured. Okay. Thank you. Yes, and, yes. Can, can you tell us something about the Abatime community so that our audience can understand um, something about the community itself? Um. The little I know about Avatime is that Avatime has very beautiful forests outside the government forest reserves. And the last time I met them, I, I told them that we, we like the initiative that we have put up to continue with the conservation of their forest estates around them. And we, we, we wish to advise all others who have beautiful forests like this because now forest um, conservation and forest management has assumed global dimensions. So every little forest you have in your corner, it has, it has global implications. So the little efforts you make to conserve it will, will have a lot of global advantages. Okay. So I, I will always give my bits of advice and my support to any community that wants to help in the conservation of their forest estates in their local environment or their community. 
So that is the beautiful atmosphere and beautiful environment that I can speak of about Avatune. Okay, and and Tony, yes. what what can you tell us about the Abatime community and the Abatime forest? Well, I mean, undoubtedly, Abatime forest is the most beautiful forest in the whole of this country, and it has also given us the most serene spot in the whole country. Uh, Avatime has the hills, has the vegetation, and has the caring people, uh, people who appreciate uh, what they have. There are still communities in Avatime where you find no mosquitoes. So it makes it very uh, welcoming to all manners of all manner of people. Uh, There has been a story that uh, some years back, you could find uh, African gray parrots in uh, the Avatime forests. And African gray parrots can only exist in very clean environment. So if we have had, or we still have African gray parrots in the Avatime forest, that should tell you the uh, quality of the forest that we have there. And uh, these people are very friendly, very welcoming, and very determined. Okay, and, and Tony, what, what are some of the challenges that you believe are faced by the community and, and specifically by the forest today? Well, I think the challenge has been due to the terrain that they uh, uh, live in. It's a very hilly terrain and uh, very rocky at that. We have a lot of farmers. Uh, the case in point is a brown rice that is still cultivated and for which reason we have a festival uh, that is celebrated annually, the Amu Fest. Uh, so that tells you the people are hardworking and industrious. But the nature of the land uh, poses some challenge to them because of the rocky areas and the terrain, the, 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 the slopes that they have to cultivate. Uh, so I think that is that, 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 that is the only challenge that I see. Okay. And, and of course, this, this uh, uh, affects economic activity in the area. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And Mr. Manso Howard, what? challenges do you see specifically for the Abatime forest and other similar forests in, in the territory that you cover? Yes, okay. Um, the main challenge that we have in the Abatime area and generally in the whole forest district enclave is um, illegal gathering of wood product, illegal cutting down of trees. And um, fortunately or unfortunately, in fact, I must say fortunately, due to the, the nature of Avatime land, the rocky nature, the hilly nature, such illegal activities are not so much endemic to that area. But then we, we, we are increasingly getting worried over other encroachment activities like um, clearing of land for clearing of the forest for other land use activities, farming activities, land development for um, landed properties, um, cultivation, um, development of um, buildings and other structures. These are some of the challenges. And charcoal burning, people will go there, cut young trees, young plants, and you know, Ghana, a lot of um, people use um, charcoal as um, commercial activities and for domestic activities as well. So these are the few challenges and especially farming activities, which normally um, um, people use um, slash and burn as a farming method, which um, destroys uh, light tracts of land. So this
these are the few challenges that I, I, I am afraid of a Timmy community must do well to clamp them down so that the project becomes um, successful and, the, and posterity too will have a share of, of whatever efforts they are putting in. So these are the few challenges that I can enumerate for now. Thank you. Okay, so, so Mr. Mentor Howard, so suppose, it, and you know, obviously we've got this program, the purpose of this program is to try to raise funding, specifically we're targeting the crypto community in the US, um, who actually are concerned about using some of their wealth to do good in um, all around the world. That's why we're trying to address that particular market and raise funding for them. And um, you've already, you know, we've already explained what the purpose is and what we're trying to achieve. And you've already given us feedback and support for the project. And so my, my next question is, if a small amount, let's assume a modest amount of funding was available or was made available by our program, and um, that was made available to a community or for a, a forestry community like Abatime or a similar community or a similar forest, um, you know, that may be applicable for a future program, how would you recommend some of those funds should be deployed to address some of those challenges that you mentioned? Um, one, um, I will envisage that um, large percentage, a, a bigger percentage of these funds should go to education of the community folks to, to, to reorient their mind from destructive um, activities like slash and burn farming, picking or cutting down, indiscriminate cutting down of trees for charcoal burning and to disabuse their mind of using the, 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 the land for other development activities. So education will take a bigger tranche of these funds. And then two, the next bigger chunk will be to establish a kind of um, revolving fund for alternative enterprises, which will move their mind out of direct usage of the forest there. So like charcoal burners, um, illegal farmers, like... Um, illegal lumbering activities. These enterprises, if we can find alternative livelihoods to engage them in, a, a, a bigger portion of this um, um, fund should also go to let them do other enterprises like beekeeping, um, kente weaving, masonry, other enterprises that will not have a negative impact on the forest because we want to do well with the forest estate that we have there. So to move their mind, because they will think that you, you have taken their livelihood from them. If you have taken their livelihood from them, then where, where else should they channel their efforts to? Then there's fund, a revolving fund for groupings, enterprise groupings, those who do this kind of um, um, venture, those who do this kind of venture, those who do this kind of venture, they will set up this revolving fund. When this group gets some um, 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 tranche, they work with it the following year or the following, um, say, two, three months, the same money goes to another group, that kind of thing. Then the, the impact of they leaving their destructive venture will not be felt much because they know that if I couldn't do this, I've been offered opportunity to do otherwise, which will also give me or yield the same kind of returns that I used to have. So these are the way I will um, 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 give off the, the fund to the communities. Thank you. And uh, that's an interesting point because my organization is actually set up to do exactly that. We call it Thank a you. social innovation studio where we go to the community and we ask the community, you know, what are your list of challenges and then prioritize them. And then, you know, other people do philanthropy where they just throw money and continually throw money at projects yeah, yeah, and that yeah. money gets exhausted. Whereas our approach is to have local people 
who we could transform into entrepreneurs to look at those problems in a different way and then talk to the crypto community over here who have access to all these new ideas and concepts like we're using NFTs to address this this problem of, of carbon offsets. And then the community, crypto community over here can use these innovations to work with those local entrepreneurs to completely reimagine solutions to those existing problems. The goal being that hopefully they will start a company and create jobs and economic growth. And then the jobs that they are creating will be more attractive to them than illegal login. And if yes. you can do that, then you address the root cause of that problem. Um, obviously, putting up security is one thing, but they will find a way around the security. But if they've got a more attractive job, logical people would choose that more attractive job. So yes. Yes. thank you for, for that, that feedback. That is good. Um, and so, Tony, let, and I know, Tony, you're kind of an educator at heart, so um, I'm sure you're going to agree with the first part of that response. But if, Absolutely. As a modest amount of sponsorship was available, how do you believe that should be deployed in the other teammate community? Yeah, thank you. You know, uh, we have had a huge German presence in the other teammate area. Question is what attracted them to that area? Yeah. And uh, so long as Germans have occupied that place for a very long time, tells you that there is something there. Uh, I would align with the aspect of education. Uh, it is important for the community to be educated uh, so that they can adapt sustainable cultural practices. And also for them to appreciate that, yes, whatever interventions are coming up are uh, for them, with them, and about them. If they feel as being part of it, then the cooperation will be very high. Uh, in that regard, I think that, for instance, uh, there are a lot of slopes that people are farming along, but then they just clear and then plant. It exposes the land to erosion. There is a possibility of them using contouring but then the knowledge is not there. So here, I think some collaboration with the district agricultural extension offices who go around, who make contact with the farmers on the ground is also very important so that they can educate the farmers on some of these uh, sustainable cultural practices. And of course, the sustainable, uh, uh, sustainable livelihood, pro alternative livelihood, livelihood projects as uh, Mr. Howard had uh, uh, alluded to is very key and I align myself to that. Uh, I could also think that there was some time ago, the Forestry Commission had uh, a project to uh, encourage communities to plant some fast growing trees and then do some sustainable charcoal production, which does not jeopardize the forest. I think this is one area that we can also look at. Uh, right now, I know people are producing uh, charcoal for export from palm kennel shells. Palm kennel is very common in various homes. Almost every home uh, had palm kennels. So the palm kennel shells uh, are there for us to use. So yes, uh, if any fund, and I wouldn't say a modest farm, a fund, it should be a substantial funding for this. So that, uh, because all this degradation, the uh, chainsaw activity, the bush burning and all, they trickle, I mean, they are traced to poverty. Yes. So if the economic activity, the economic life of the community can be tackled, certainly, uh, we will manage to restore the true integrity of the Abatima Forest. Okay, thank you, Tony. And, and Tony, I just want to give you an opportunity. Is there anything else that you would like to share with our audience today? Um, well, first of all, I would want to commend this initiative uh, because 
when I started, uh, it was virtually a one-man show on a very small scale, but we managed to make some impact. And I have been praying and hoping that there will be uh, an intervention like this. So my commendation for you is very, very high. And I pray that this succeeds very well. Uh, I would also want to thank Mr. Howard and then the uh, overlord of the Abatima traditional area, uh, Osie Ajatepo, for his commitment to this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Manso Howard, is there anything else that you would like to share with the audience? Yes. I would also like to um, extend my sincere gratitude to you for this um, great and kind intervention. I must say that for your commission as a whole, we are so much grateful. These are some of the things that we like all other stakeholders to, to, to come in to help. In fact, um, Forestry Commission, we always preach that apart from our Ghana, apart from the Ghana Forest Reserve, which are which have acts and other decrees in their protection, some of the other outside forest um, estates do not have such um, decrees and uh, acts covering them. It's it's falls within the hands of the community to assist the Forestry Commission in managing those forest estates, which lies outside forest reserves. So with this kind intervention, I will plead with the community that they should all have the buy-in and support this project so that it becomes very much successful. Because we always say when the last tree dies, the last man will definitely die. So if the if you are not planting trees, at least the little tree, the, the few trees that you have in your community, there's a great need for you to conserve them, protect them to reach maturity. Because apart from enjoying other social benefits from it, you have a, a benefits in, in cash to do other ventures in your community that you want to do. And apart, apart from that, you, you enjoy the forest microclimate, you, you enjoy a, a nice environmental serene condition. And, and what have you? You, you? you have posterity to always clap for you. That is what my ancestors did. What is the little me too I can do when, when my time comes so that generations yet unborn will come and also clap for me and thank me for doing my bit? We all have to do our bit. Government is doing a bit. Communities should do their bit. Individuals should also do their bit. So I envisage and I, I entreat all community members and other communities to learn from this example that the Abetime project is coming and bringing on board so that everybody will, will uh, replicate this in their various communities throughout the whole country and, and other surrounding or uh, um, our, our neighboring countries. So this is what I would say. Thank you. Okay. And the point Mr. Howard made about uh, community buy-in is very, very key. Uh, I managed a conservation uh, education center in the National Park, uh, Ankasa National Park in the southwestern corner of this country. At a point in time, the forest guards contributed money to buy uh, bullets to hunt animals. You know, luckily we managed to get wind of it and uh, those guys were fired. What did that say? That means that they didn't actually buy into the, uh, the very vocation that they were embarking on. So yeah, the community buy-in is very, very key. I want that to be taken special note of. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. what I'm going to do is open the floor to questions, and I can see that Ernest has already asked a, a bunch of questions. Um, but Ernest, before I, I bring you up to, to ask some of these questions, again, I just want to thank Mr. Ha um, Manso Howard and, and Tony again. Originally, we were just going to have Tony today, and we were going to have Mr. Manso Howard next week. 
Um, but, you know, Tony's an entrepreneur. He's very busy and he was running into some staff shortage problems. And so we weren't certain whether he would be available to Dave. And we're very glad that he was able to join us. So thank you, Tony. And Mr. Mansa had thank you for adjusting your schedule and bringing that okay. forward to, to this week. So, Ernest, um, we're way over time, um, but I know you've got a bunch of questions in the notes. Do you, do you want to ask some of your questions? Um, I didn't really have a whole lot of questions. I did just have some notes. Um, so I'd, I'd much rather let some of the other people that joined ask any questions that they have. My question is about um, the the communities around the Abitime Forest. Do they are are they interested in other forms of of commerce, of work, of uh, of of entrepreneurship, other ways to make a living, like like we're proposing oh. here? That's what it sounds like, right? Yes, yes, definitely, yes. You see, um, as um, we all know that uh, poverty is the source of um, the destruction of our forest. People go to the forest to destroy for what purpose? For livelihood. They go there for livelihood. So if we are able to um, secure an alternative livelihood venture for them, why not? It is just a matter of us or the project identifying key ventures that they will be interested in which will only give them returns for their investments. If that is secured, definitely they'll go. It's just like um, what we have um, in the Galamse areas. If the person knows that this venture, I will get good returns as even just a, a fraction of what I used to get from my Galamse, and it will be peaceful and it will be a, a, a kind of um, venture that I will not entertain any problems, I will not entertain any fears, I will not have any problems with government. Why not? Any any uh, uh, rational human being will go for it. But why do I have to go and do things that the, the, the law enforcement agencies will be chasing me up and down? If I have my peace of mind to venture into other uh, investment that I'll have my peace of mind, definitely they will go into it. So let's identify the kind of ventures that people around there will have interest in. And while they will have profit and they will have nice good living they will, they will get into it as simple as that yes uh thank you, so thank my, you answer, for... my answer looks general but that is that is the the the, the, the truth yes, yes the truth. To, 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 to to back up uh mr Mensah's uh, position yes the people in the area engage in a lot of uh, uh commercial activities the women do trading, they do uh, a small ruminant keeping, uh, there's beekeeping, uh, uh, and then the snail petty farming, trading. Much, much. Yeah, there's petty trading. Snail, snail farming. Yeah. Snail farming, yes, and then mushroom farming. You know, I actually buy mushroom from one gentleman from Pane for my tortoises. Uh, so yes, they actually engage in other commercial activities. That's great. Thank you, and uh, thank you both for taking the time today. This was very informative. Appreciate it. Yeah. So, well, so in addition to that, Mark. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, in addition to that, the snail farming, mushroom farming. Uh, of course, because it's a it's an arable community where farming is there. This is vegetable farming, rice farming maize farming, all those ones that uh, originally are the ones that give them food can be added on to give them some money. And uh, another skill training, dress making, carpentry, and all those things. There, there are people who are doing those things in the community. Yeah. I think we should be looking at those yeah. ones. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, and just for clarification, um, when Mr. Mansa had mentioned Kalamse, that's actually illegal gold mining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when yeah, yeah. we've actually been speaking with the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, because we've also got a gold mine project in Ghana, and uh, it's the same social innovation program we discussed with them so that local owners of gold mines in Ghana can retain ownership of their mine 
and then reinvest in the community and create mm -hmm. alternative livelihoods to illegal gold mining in Ghana as well. So it's a similar approach. And so yeah. does anybody else on the call have any questions or comments? Maybe we can just touch on one of Ernest's questions here. Um, how much of the tree removal is for login lumber or fuel and encroachment? Um, so somebody mentioned what? that there's um, tree removal um, going on. And when people are cutting down these trees, is that to sell um, timber you know, or is it for fuel or encroachment? You know, our luck is that the hilly terrain yes. uh, is an inhibition to this yeah. uh, illegal log logging. So there are many areas that are inaccessible to these uh, people. So the logging is not uh, as prevalent as yes. it happens in many other places. Yes. I don't know if I'm right, Mr. Mensah. That, that you are you are you are hundred percent right. Yes, I I I said it early on that uh, due to the um, undulating nature of the land, it it gives us a fortunate situation. Yeah. This world worth of illegal people from uh, marking on their nefarious activities because if the uh, the, the terrain condition is not good enough, you you venture into uh, uh, um, cutting out of trees and then you lose. Nobody. No, nobody wants to venture into a business that you will not make a good yield out of. Yeah. So the undulating nature, the terrain condition is a plus, it's an advantage for us to conserve the area. So even though there are some illegal activities, it is not on that high scale, like in other parts of the region or in other parts of the country. Yeah. And to add to that, uh, since the installment of uh, the new Paramount Chief, mm -hmm. he has ensured uh, that the community keep watch over the forest. So that this also true. helps to curb the uh, uh, activity. Yes. Yeah. That is true. Okay, so we're up against the clock again here. So I'd like to thank Mr. Manso Howard again for calling in and Tony as well. We really appreciate your time and everybody else for calling in, the Paramount Chief of other team, A, Curtis and everybody else. And um, could I, go ahead. Yeah, could, I just, could I just ask one question? Um, I'm curious if uh, folks could would maybe be interested in describing the education infrastructure, you know, like maybe in the Ho district, if you want to be specific or, you know, the Avatame region in general. Um, and also, you know, the IT access um, in the education system, because um, I have a lot of privileges and most of the time I'm working with people and myself, I'm just assuming that everybody has internet access. And when we talk about education, you know, people are bringing their cell phones and stuff. So um, I, I, I would like to know, you know, um, yeah, what, what it does look like in there, um, you know, because it kind of helps me see the the impact that in change that we can see, you, you so, know, that a lot of my audience or, you know, people that I know are quite familiar with how our education in IT is. And some people may not have, you know, those childhood stories of growing up and camping with forests and, um so yeah, I'd appreciate that. So, hey, Ernest, I have a suggestion. Um, because we brought forward Mr. Manso Howard from next week to this week, um, what we could do is maybe make that the topic of the discussion for next week. And so the call next week, um, because next Thursday is Thanksgiving, maybe we'll move that call to Wednesday and maybe we can make the focus of that call um, exactly your question about you know, education and IT um, in, in the community. That'd be awesome. Yeah, maybe some of the agricultural infrastructure too. Um, you know, in the U.S., I've worked, you know, in Amish communities and I've worked in, you know, city communities and rural communities. Um, but yeah, it would, it's just good to know like the lay of the land so that 
people have an idea of you know what a little bit means <laughs> for a okay. lot of people can yes. i make a little uh, contribution to that hello okay tony yeah uh you know as far as it goes i am aware that uh, there is a, a facility for the avatima community an ict center but uh, it is non-functional mainly because mm -hmm. of data availability uh, people are not able to buy data so that made that center uh, a non-functioning facility. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if uh, Osea would want to uh, expand. On well, that. let's let's address this next week because we're okay. right at the top of the hour. I'm sure people have other meetings okay. to go yeah. to. So right. um, what what I'll do is I'll end the call here, and then we'll okay. talk internally to figure out how to address this topic next week. Thank you. Okay. So again, thank you everybody for calling in. Thank you. Bye. Bye for now. Bye, Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Bye.